And now I'd like to introduce Senior Vice President and Provost Jonathan Wickert, who will provide welcoming remarks for Iowa State Research Day and kick off the first event of our day, uh, a distinguished lecture by Dr. Gregory Petsko. Um, I want to say that we are all very fortunate uh, that Provost Rickert has been such a staunch supporter of research, uh, particularly advancing our research mission here at Iowa State, and we are all very grateful for his leadership and support in helping us all discover and create together. So Jonathan, if you would join us up here, let's give Provost Wickard a round of applause. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, really appreciate you coming out for uh, what is our second uh, of, of many uh, annual uh, research conferences here on campus. And I, I fondly recall uh, last year's uh, research conference and all of the uh, outstanding uh, connections that were established uh, across campus and colleagues meeting each other in different uh, disciplines, different departments, different colleges. And uh, I, I look forward to uh, similar successful outcomes from, uh, from this year's uh, conference and, uh, and agenda. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and uh, I'm delighted to be here on behalf of uh, our president, uh, Wendy Winterstein, and uh, her uh, staunch support as well for the research enterprise at Iowa State, and really, uh, you know, the land-grant uh, uh, traditions at this institution and how research is not uh, an island on campus, nor is education, nor is extension. You know, our philosophy here at Iowa State University, the principles that we uh, ascribe to are that these are all complementary uh, missions uh, as outlined in our strategic plan and that the, the research enterprise enhances what we do in the classroom. It enhances the experience of our undergraduate students as well as graduate students just as extension is a fantastic opportunity to take your discoveries here on campus and get them out uh, out across the state and dr petsko and i had a, a very uh, a warm conversation a few minutes ago about uh, about the moral act and uh, the land grant mission and how those roots run so deep here at at iowa state universities you know uh we we speak a lot about uh about research uh, impact uh, everybody wants to know uh, what's the impact of your research uh, at Iowa State University. Our, our Board of Regents, you know, uh, regularly asks us about the impact of, <clears throat> of our research. Uh, legislators ask us about the impact uh, of, our, of our research. Um, you know, they want to see a return on investment. And, you know, you know uh, the fact that Iowa State provides an outstanding return on investment of the, the people of Iowa. Uh, in this institution just as well for the for the nation and our impact is not only here in Iowa but nationally and really really around the world and and that impact uh, is is oftentimes challenging to be able to describe we we tend to default to uh, to numbers right uh, sometimes we 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 try to quantify impact maybe because it's easy to do we can talk about dollars of research funding coming in we could talk about number of publications or number of patents or number of companies uh, started. And, and those, are, those are appropriate things to measure. We'd, we'd rather those numbers be, be larger than, than, be, than be small. But it's also a very imperfect way to describe uh, impact. Uh, impact is also about a, a story. Impact is also about improving the human condition. That's really, that's really why we do this. That's really why we do all this. And it's about improving lives and improving livelihoods. And, and that's why I'm excited about the, the, the theme of this year's conference and, and really this, this, this marriage made in heaven. And, and that is that all of our disciplines here at the university uh, need to work together uh, as, as a system. And I'm, I'm was watching these pictures up here just like you were, and I'm, I'm reminded, first of all, of Jurassic Park. <laughs> and I'm also reminded of the Terminator movies, too. You know? and, and the fact is that a lot of times science advances you know, pretty rapidly, and we can do things before it's totally obvious that we should be doing things. Right? <laughs> and, and really, those kind of conversations, I think, are ones you're going to find very, uh, very fruitful here today. But, Research impact is really about that, it's really about that story. It's that story about our mission at the university, which is all around knowledge. It's about 
transferring knowledge to the next generation of students. And it's about you know, creating knowledge through our scholarly inquiry. And it's about you as, as faculty leaders and, and researchers on campus uh, of being able to ask the right research questions that are, that are deep and meaningful ones. And I think this conference today also very much fits in to a, a, a broader dialogue, which is really a national dialogue about the role of major research universities these days. There, there is a, a political drive, uh, as you know, to, to try to commoditize you know, higher education. We'll measure the output of higher education by um, the starting salary of graduates. We'll measure it by the number of graduates that stay in the state. And those are important things. We, we again, want those numbers to be high. But there's something to be said about the role of a major research university as really kind of the, the bedrock of, of the citizenry. And again, it's about improving lives and livelihoods. So I, I, I really, I think it's in this much broader context that major u research universities like Iowa State are, are going to continue to play a really important role for our country. And it's up to us to be able to effectively tell the story of the importance of that research mission, how it changes lives, how it addresses important societal challenges, how there's a great return on investment, and how it brings all these disciplines together, all aimed toward improving, improving the, the, the human condition in lives that, are worth, lives that are worth living. And I'm very proud of the work that we do uh, across campus. Um, and we're gonna hear a lot about that today, and you're gonna, you're gonna hear from some of your colleagues about that. But I wanted to, I wanted to highlight uh, just, just a few um, stories, if you will, faculty stories of, of successes in this area. Um, April Eisman in our art and visual culture department, you know, she earned uh, a National Endowment for the Humanities uh, Fellowship uh, last year, and, and she went and studied the work of uh, artists in, in communist era uh, uh, Germany. Uh, Grant Arndt uh, also had a similar fellowship, and he did work on um, uh, Native American uh, news here in the Midwest. Olivia Valentine in her College of Design is working with a, a colleague to look at blending textile design and construction processes with electronic music, right? Very interesting interdisciplinary type of work that, that we can do here at Iowa State University. Monica Haddad in community and regional planning is using her expertise to address environmental preservation issues uh, in Brazil. Best practices we learned here in Iowa making a difference uh, in the world. And Dara Wald in the Greenlee School is working with her colleagues to better understand the role of trust and credibility uh, in science communication. Key issues uh, in, our, in our national dialogue uh, right now. Th those are just a few examples. There, there, there's countless of these going on across campus. Uh, but again, it's all directed towards making Iowa and the world a better place through our, our work here on, on, uh, on campus. So really my main job, okay, is to introduce our, our distinguished uh, keynote speaker this morning, uh, Dr. Gregory uh, Petsko. And as you can see on the, on the slide here, he holds affiliations with three uh, outstanding uh, universities and has a very a uh, distinguished career in the field of biochemistry and, and chemistry. He's a member of both the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy uh, of Medicine, and his scholarship is focused on understanding neurodegenerative diseases such as uh, ALS, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, and, uh, and Parkinson's. And, and he has been a, a, a national leader in the, in the dialogue of translating uh, scientific discoveries uh, to broader audiences and being able to have have that conversation and we are we're delighted Dr. Petsko to have you here today he, he mentioned to me that he's visited Iowa State uh, uh, many times we're thrilled to have you back on campus and we look forward to uh, uh, learning from you this morning so Dr. Petsko Well, thank you very much. Uh, it is good to be back. Uh, I've always enjoyed my time here. Um, it, it, it is 
we, we have this conversation about the land-grant college system. It is an extraordinary thing to think about. We were talking about this. Uh, you probably all know that the land-grant college system was started by Abraham Lincoln. Now, you might have thought, being in the middle of the Civil War and all, that he had other things on his mind. But at the same time he started the land-grant system, this extraordinary individual founded the National Academy of Sciences and planned out the Transcontinental Railroad. Okay, any one of those things is like 10 times more important than anything most presidents have ever done during their entire time in office. And we're talking about a few months of this man's extraordinary life. It, it makes it almost superfluous for me to talk about creativity and innovation when we've had someone running this country in our past who was sort of the personification of those qualities. But I think it is worth talking about because we, we flatter ourselves that innovation and creativity is something that we care about, that this is one of the hallmarks of America as a country. Our system, we believe, produces this in abundance. And the question I want to talk to you about today is, is this something we can in fact nurture and foster? If it can't be taught, can it at least be encouraged and watered so it can grow? Now, I like dialogues better than monologues. But the nature of this is something of a monologue. But if there's something I say that causes you to have an urgent question, please do stick your hand up, and I'm happy to interrupt myself in the middle. As you heard, I have a somewhat diverse set of affiliations. Uh, this is partly because of life history and partly because I suspect no one institution wants to be responsible for me. Uh, so for many years I was chair of the biochemistry department at Brandeis University and I left there to go to New York City about five years ago uh, when my wife, Lori Glimpshire, who's a, an immunologist and scientist at Harvard, became dean of Cornell Medical School. And when your wife says to you, <clears throat> you're going to join the faculty down here, right? <laughs> you understand what the godfather, Don Vito Corleone, meant by an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> so I moved down to New York, where I still am at the moment. And after I'd gotten there, I had to stay in Boston for a little while and sell a house and so forth. And after I'd been down in New York for about three years, my wife promptly left New York and moved back to Boston. I tried not to take that personally. <laughs> she did this for two reasons. One was to be nearer our kids who live in Boston. They're, they're all grown up now uh, and grandchildren and whatnot. But the other reason was because she was offered the job of president and CEO of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, a job she now holds. So I will be shortly moving back to Boston. And, and by the way, if you gave me a choice between moving and having my fingernails pulled out one by one, I would say, start with the pinky. <laughs> but I'm going to be moving back to Boston, uh, where I'll be uh, taking up a chair at Harvard Medical School in about six months' time. And would to God that would be the end of it, but given past history, I have no confidence that that is indeed the case. By the way, I realize that this has nothing to do with the topic of the lecture. So you may ask, why did I just tell you all this? And the answer is, I'm soliciting pity. <laughs> I don't get that at home, so I try to get it wherever I can. OK. So it seems to me that if we are going to concern ourselves with issues like creativity and innovation, we might start by asking if we look at places where creativity and innovation have flourished in the sciences over the last 50, 60, 70 years, are there common characteristics involved in the place and in the people who were there? And I think this exercise has a lot to recommend it. And I've selected a few such institutions, as you can see, Bell Labs, 
uh, the Weizmann Institute in Israel, the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, the MRC Lab for Molecular Biology in Cambridge, England, and there are a bunch more that I could have listed, the Institute Pasteur and so forth, but I think if you just look at a few of them, you start to get the idea. And the idea is pretty interesting, to be honest with you. So let's look at Bell Labs, for example. Eight Nobel Prizes came out of the work at Bell Labs. Among these things were the transistor, the laser, most of our common magnetic materials, charge couple device detectors, high resolution microscopy, the Unix operating system, the discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation, and they also made a lot of telephones. Pretty amazing place. Okay. And it had a bunch of characteristics that are in common with the other institutions I'm going to talk about. I'll list those characteristics in a moment. But this is an example of a place where creativity and innovation flourished until, thanks to the idiots that run the country, it, they were forced to divest themselves from AT&T, were bought out by Lucent Laboratories, and basically haven't been heard of since. The MRC lab in Cambridge, England, was founded right after World War II. And it was a place where Francis Crick and James Watson worked out the double helical structure of DNA. Ten Nobel Prizes have gone to this one small institution, uh, including two Nobel Prizes to Fred Sanger, one for protein sequencing and another for DNA sequencing. Uh, electron microscopy was basically developed there as a biological tool. Monoclonal antibodies were invented there. Believe it or not, Cesar Milstein, who invented monoclonal antibodies, along with Georges Kohler, went to the university, Cambridge University, and said, I think these might be good for something. We should patent it. And they took a look at it and said, this will never be good for anything, and refused to patent it. Had they done so, Cambridge would now be the wealthiest institution on the planet by probably an order of magnitude. But they never did. Uh, genomics, OK? Much of the early genome sequencing technology was developed there. The ribosome structure was worked out by one of the people there. I could go on and on, but you get the idea. The Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, founded by Abram Flexner, a remarkable man. I'll tell you a little bit more about him in a moment in that he didn't even have a college degree. <laughs> but Flexner created an institution that has nurtured 33 Nobel laureates, 41 of the 56 Fields Medals in Mathematics, and has had among its luminaries Albert Einstein, von Neumann, Oppenheimer, Kurt Goodell, and so forth. It's just ridiculous. Okay. And then we have the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. Six Nobel Prizes from this tiny country, three of the Turing Awards. Much of the early work on electronic computers was done there. Amniocentesis was invented there. Multiple sclerosis drugs that are in use all around the world were developed there. Tumor suppressor genes were discovered there in part, and so forth. Ridiculous. Okay. All of these places punch above their weight. The characteristics, Bell Labs was a fairly large institution, though the research part of it wasn't enormous. But the fact is, most of these institutions are pretty small. And several of them are in pretty small countries. And yet their creative productivity has been staggering. How come? Well, I've thought about this a lot. And there are common characteristics that I've been able to identify for all of these institutions. One is they have no hierarchical structure to speak of. Oh, they're directors and so forth. But your position in the hierarchy means nothing. Okay? The best scientists at the MRC lab in Cambridge had offices that were smaller than a closet. Nobody was treated special. Nobody was regarded as being better than anybody else. Nobody was given anything over and above anybody else. And nobody was told what to do by somebody else. There were no demands for any short-term results at any of these institutions. You were given freedom to take the long view and work on things that might take 10, 15, or more years to come to fruition. And if nothing happened in the first five or six, you weren't fired or reassigned. This is actually incredibly important in an age where we live in a country where most companies report quarterly results. 
the dumbest idea since Custer thought he could surround the entire Sioux Nation. They all have stable long-term funding. You got a project you want to do that might take 15 years, they would say to you, okay, you got 15 years of support. The support didn't come from the government. All these institutions got block grants from either the government or from, in the case of Bell Labs, from AT&T, and then internally, they worked out who would get what money for what project. Now that's a model we don't have much in this country, but it is an absolute characteristic of all of these institutions. The funding was decided locally. I think that's something to keep in mind. They all had a mixture of scientists of very diverse background. In fact, at all of these institutions, there was at least one person who won a Nobel Prize who didn't have a PhD. All right. And they had a willingness to accept an extremely high failure rate. In fact, in one or two cases when I talked to some of the people who'd run these institutions, I'm, I'm actually friendly with a bunch of them, then they all said the same thing. They said, if we don't have a lot of projects that fail, we're not being brave enough. We're being too cautious, too conservative. And they all said the same thing about who they hired. They hired people with a high degree of curiosity and imagination. And this mattered more than pedigree. It mattered more than publication history. It mattered more than anything else in their selection of individuals. They wanted people who cared deeply about problems and who were able to think broadly and wildly even about those problems. So this is the common characteristic set. And I think it's telling because we have created a culture in this country, both in academia and in industry, that actually tries very hard to select against most of these characteristics. Now, we fight that, of course. But the fact is, we couldn't shoot ourselves in the foot any better than if we took deadly aim at our big toe and fired. So given that we live in an era where the imagination is being throttled by bureaucracy, by the demand for short-term results, by difficulties in funding, by all of the things that we know are wrong with the system today, how do we set our imaginations free? What is it that can get us closer to the ideal that I've been describing? That's what I want to talk about for the rest of this lecture. So I'm not the first person to ask this question. The first person to ever get the Nobel Prize in chemistry, Jacobus van Hoff in Holland, actually asked this question, believe it or not, 115 years ago. He was curious about what made great scientists. And in a research project entirely of his own, he studied the biographies of 100 scientists from the past and present. And he found that 52 of them were characterized by an extremely high degree of interest in the arts and literature. In fact, so high an interest in the arts and literature that a number of them had artistic or literary occupations as part of their background or their current interests. He hypothesized that their success correlated with their power of imagination, and that it was this other stuff, the non-scientific stuff, that set their imagination loose. Near as I can tell, his observations have been almost totally ignored since. The only person I know of who's paid any attention to this besides me is Flexner, the guy who founded the Institute for Advanced Study, who specifically quotes this when he talks about what he had in mind when he set up the Institute for Advanced Study, which brings me to Flexner. Okay. This is an amazing guy. No medical degree, yet he's the one who wrote the report in the early part of the 20th century that changed medical education by getting rid of all the crap medical schools and setting up a science-based medical curriculum in the ones that remained. 
He then proceeded to start the Rockefeller University in New York, as if that wasn't enough, then started the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And all for a guy who basically had no scientific background whatsoever. This was one amazing individual. He was once asked by somebody if he didn't think Marconi was the greatest scientist around, because Marconi had, of course, invented the radio. And Flexner said Marconi's uninteresting and unimportant. The man was astonished. And Flexner said, I'll tell you why. Marconi was inevitable. Once you had the important basic discoveries, if Marconi hadn't done radio, somebody else would have in a year or two. But it was those basic discoveries that mattered, and they were done by Maxwell and Hertz. They did the fundamental research. And he then went on to explain that Maxwell and Hertz were characterized by, among other things, great interests outside of the scientists, both in art and in literature. And he thought that was important. He founded a private school, still in existence, in which the standard model of education, rigid subjects, basically by field, was thrown out. And students were given a tremendous mixture of the arts, the humanities, sciences, the social sciences, all jumbled together as if there was no distinction between any of these courses. And then, of course, as I said, he founded the Institute for Advanced Study, which ended up with 33 Nobel Prizes. You probably haven't heard of him. Flexner. Remember the name. So if we look at most of the people I've been talking about, the Nobel laureates from these small institutions, the historical people that I've discussed, they're characterized by a great interest in the arts or humanities as well as in the sciences. Many of them specifically did not major in science in college. I didn't. My chemistry degree was an afterthought. I started out majoring in classical literature. Okay. Harold Varmus, for example, who won the Nobel Prize for founding oncogenes, and then went on to direct the National Cancer Institute and the National Institutes of Health, as well as the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute in New York City. Harold Varmus was an English literature major. All right. I could go on, but this shows up all the time when you look at people like this. They frequently come to science later, and their initial interests are often very powerfully oriented towards the arts and the humanities. Many of them turn out to be amateur musicians. Some of them are even half good. <laughs> Amazing. Now, this idea that the arts and the humanities might link to science goes back a long way. If we had individuals who are interested in both or expert in both, what do we call them? We call them Renaissance men or Renaissance women. Okay. Well, what about the Renaissance? Well, you, you think of figures like Leonardo da Vinci. There's a great new biography of Leonardo da Vinci by Isaacson. Um, but if you look at figures like Leonardo da Vinci, painter, sculptor, scientist, engineer. Okay. And no distinction among those things in his own mind. Each of these things as important to anything else, his engineering skills playing a role in his sculpture and so forth, and architecture. He was also an architect. I spent a lot of time in Italy, I'm glad to say, and one of my favorite places is Florence. And in Florence, my favorite place of all is the Church of Santa Croce. How many of you have ever been there? Good for you. The ones who haven't go, all right? When you walk in the door of the Church of Santa Croce, look left on the left side of the apse, right past the entrance, and then look right. And what you'll see is the tomb of Galileo on your left, and the tomb of Michelangelo on your right. These two giants of the Renaissance face each other across the apse of the Church of Santa Croce. The amazing thing is they never met. Their life bands didn't overlap. 
you feel like you want to introduce them to one another. Galileo, this is Michelangelo. Mike, this is Galileo. <laughs> but they, too, shared the characteristics of Leonardo da Vinci. So Michelangelo was not just, of course, an extraordinary sculptor and painter. He was also an architect, and he was interested in other aspects of the sciences, like anatomy. Galileo, in addition to being a scientist, was a poet and a patron of the arts. And nobody thought anything unusual about that. Those shared occupations and interests cutting across such a swath of discipline were considered totally normal for that day and age in people of greatness. And now they're buried 100 feet apart in the Church of Santa Croce. When you get a chance, go pay them a visit. Say, how do you do to great people? So why don't we have this today? Why is it so difficult to reconcile the arts, humanities, and sciences today when it was so easy to do it before? Now, you'll get occasionally an answer like, well, it's so much more you have to learn today in any one subject. You don't have the luxury of studying the others. Nonsense. It has nothing to do with it. It's a cultural problem, not a problem of density of information. And we know this because, among other things, these Nobel laureates and other people I've been talking about today have managed to figure out how to do it, despite the fact that it's not easy to do. But the obstacles to doing it are considerable, and they are based on a set of what I call zombie ideas. What are zombie ideas? Well, as you see, I've shown here this poster of the Night of the Living Dead. Okay, George Romero's film. Most of you may not know this, but a zombie, of course, has nothing to do with an undead creature that walks around trying to eat your brains. A zombie in voodoo religion is a person who is possessed by a magical spell from a shaman and has to do that individual's bidding. It was George Romero in this film, set in Pittsburgh, okay, who created the whole modern idea of a zombie as an undead creature that goes around trying to eat flesh. And by the standards of the genre, I must say, Night of the Living Dead has hardly ever been surpassed. If you've never seen it, you should. Uh, this thing is both remarkably effective as a creepy crawly film and savagely ironic and nihilistic. And I won't say anything more about that, but it is quite a work of art. I borrowed the idea because what I find is true is that we have in higher education a bunch of zombie ideas. These are ideas that should be dead, but somehow they're crawling around trying to eat our brains. What are they? C.P. Snow talked about them a little bit when he talked about the two cultures. Now, I actually hate this book because I think it goes too far towards trying to separate the idea of science and the non-scientists. But he does go through some of the problems with reconciling the cultures and how that was becoming increasingly difficult when he wrote the book in the 50s. We know today that the idea that you can't reconcile these cultures is bunk. We can see this not just in the great people that I've mentioned, but also in the fact that art can be inspired by science. There's a structure of a helical protein, and there's something that inspired it. But science can also be inspired by art. Remember Kekulé. So Kekulé was a chemist who's trying to figure out what the structure of benzene was like. And this was a huge problem for chemists in the 19th century. They couldn't figure out what benzene looked like. It had, its chemical properties made no sense. And the various formulas that they came up with it didn't work, didn't match the known composition of benzene, and couldn't explain the properties of benzene. And they went round and round for quite a long time. And then Kekulé, who had a classical education, 
and was familiar with, among other things, the classical image of the Ouroboros, the snake eating its own tail, had a dream about the Ouroboros. And he realized that the answer to the problem was that benzene was a circular molecule. So science can also be inspired by art, and frequently is. Now, one of the obstacles to getting these fields together is our balkanization of subjects in our educational system. OK, I did a secondary major in chemistry. So I had to take a lot of science courses. I took calculus, molecular biology, cell biology, biochemistry, physical chemistry. I took Newtonian physics. I took organic chemistry, all kinds of stuff, right? I got to tell you, virtually none of that has been of any use to me in my career. <laughs> yes, it's true it gave me some fundamental principles and a basic vocabulary in these subjects. But to be honest with you, I could have gotten that on my own. That isn't that hard to get. Most of the advanced ideas in these courses have turned out to be wrong, because that's the way science works. And in any case, none of them have much bearing on the work I do now, which is trying to find a cure for neurodegenerative diseases. But the courses I took that have been of most value to me in my career, I had to squeeze in. And they were art history. Boy, was that useful. Politics, economics, sociology, European history, classics, creative writing, music appreciation. These courses taught me how to think. These courses taught me how to analyze text and think about what it really means. These courses taught me how to critically defend an argument or, in some cases, critically attack my own argument. These courses taught me all the things that have been of most value to me in my pursuit of the truth. Because getting at the truth is what they're all about. Now, there were courses I couldn't squeeze in that I really wish I had taken. All right? But by the way, art history, great story. So I didn't want to take art history. I had to take it because I needed a distribution requirement in the arts. Princeton University, where I was a student at that time, had this ridiculous requirement that you had to take courses in a bunch of different fields. Okay. I was ticked off about that. All right. So I had to take two courses my senior year that I didn't want to take. One was philosophy of science. I had to take a philosophy course. So I figured, OK, I'll take philosophy of science. Got a D. <laughs> the other course I really didn't want to take was art history. Got an A+. I promptly, after I graduated, went to Europe for three years. During that time, I went to every major museum on every continent. And this course meant I actually understood something about what I was looking at. Few, if any, courses I ever took in my entire educational experience have meant more to me as a person than the art history course I didn't want to take. The idea that students should be free to plan their own education, that's nonsense. All right. they don't, they're not smart enough. They're not wise enough. By letting them do that, we abrogate our responsibility as educators to tell them, no, you need to take stuff you don't think you should take. The classical courses I took, remember as a classical literature major? That led me to write one of my most famous essays, an essay called Shadows on the Wall. It was inspired by Plato's Allegory of the Cave. And this gets us back to zombie ideas. So do you all know this one? This is really interesting. So Plato, of course, invented these dialogues between his brother Glaucon and Socrates. And one of these dialogues, Socrates Plato has Socrates talk about the allegory of the cave, and this is the way it works. All right, imagine a race of people who spend their entire life in a cave 
in stone chairs, unable to move, facing the back wall of the cave. Behind them is a large fire at the entrance of the cave, and it casts on the back wall of the cave where they're looking shadows from people that pass between the fire and the cave. So all they can see on the wall are the shadows of things that go by on the outside world. Plato says they're going to come to think those shadows are the outside world, that the outside world is a shadow world. That's what it is. Now take one of those people, take them out of the chair, put them outside of the cave, and let them see reality. Well, the first thing that will happen, of course, is they'll be dumbstruck by reality being three-dimensional and colors and all kinds of things that they can't imagine from the shadows on the wall. But they'll quickly come to really be excited by this. And Plato then goes further and says, now let's have that person go back in to the cave and explain to the people who are still stuck there that all they're seeing are shadows on the wall and that's not reality. That reality is much more complex and wonderful than anything they can think about. And Plato says, and of course, when this person does that, they will try to kill him. And of course, Plato's right. Because when you smash somebody's delusion, that is often what happens. So many of our ideas about education, about the arts and the sciences, are not just zombie ideas, they're shadows on the wall. They're a reflection of what we think reality is like, but have nothing to do with reality. But when you try to overturn them, you meet the same resistance that Plato's character does in the allegory of the cave. So the courses that I wish I'd taken in college, I never got to take. Couldn't figure out a way to get them in. Couldn't get persuade anybody to let me take them instead of some of the science courses. I could have used more philosophy. I could have used a course in critical thinking. I've taught a few, and it's a great idea, I think, to teach it. Lots more history and literature. And at the bottom is the course that I really wish I'd taken when I became department chair. <laughs> Boy, do I wish I'd taken that course. More about the zombie ideas in a moment. But what is the great enemy of creativity and innovation? Why do we have this problem? One of the reasons we have this problem is that, like the allegory of the cave, when you are a creative and innovative individual, you are going to be proposing things that run contrary to what people believe. And people are profoundly uncomfortable by, about that and try to suppress those activities and individuals that might threaten their belief. It is, of course, the blind trust in authority that is the biggest enemy we have. That authority can be religious, it can be bureaucratic, it can be doctrinaire in politics or anything else. Doesn't matter what it is. Blind trust in authority. This battle was fought and lost and fought and won over and over and over again throughout the years. One of the classic examples is shown here. This is the Scopes Monkey Trial in Tennessee, which had to do with the teaching of evolution. And on the left, you see Clarence Darrow, attorney for the defense, defending the doctrine of evolution. And on the right, William Jennings Bryan for the prosecution, defending the Bible. And I've argued with creation scientists and others for many years, and I've found that you can find common ground sometimes if you're careful and thoughtful, but it's very difficult to deal with a problem when people believe that all the authority they need, everything they need to believe, comes from something that God spoke to a small number of people about thousands of years ago which is why I've always been fond of Clarence Darrow, who said to William Jennings Bryan, how do you know God didn't speak to Charles Darwin? Now, if you don't have a mixture of the arts and the humanities along with science, 
If science is set loose on its own, as your provost mentioned at the start of this meeting today, then science becomes cold and sterile and potentially dangerous. This is the strongest reason I know of for having a deep interest in subjects outside the scientists. The financial crisis of 2008, 2009 was largely created by a bunch of mathematicians and physicists who were hired by financial firms to come up with models for how they could do trading that couldn't possibly go wrong. And they trusted their models so much that they brought down the economy of the world. If they'd been leavened by the arts and the humanities, which among other things teaches us humility, it may not have happened. So one example of this is the Tuskegee syphilis study, where horribly people, African Americans, were actually given syphilis and not told they were given syphilis to see what would happen to them by supposedly scientific people in the interests of supposedly science. By the way, I didn't learn about this in any science class. No biology course taught this, and they should. All right? I learned about this in American history class. Here's an example. This is a scientist injecting an African American with syphilis. This borders on murder. You think that's the only time this ever happened? No. Look at this. From 1944 to 1946, a professor at the University of Chicago, OK, infected, invest, infected psychiatric patients with malaria so they could test experimental malaria treatments on them, creating the experimental animal, a human being, that he was going to then do tests on. And you see some of the other examples. I won't bother reading them. But it's terrifying. All right. The people who do this do this in the name of a science we don't support. And they do it in part because their souls have never been broadened by exposure to things outside the realm of science. If you care about the arts, the humanities, you don't do this because you learn to care about people. You don't get that in physics class. I've always been fond of Fritz Lang's movie Metropolis. If you've never seen it, it's fabulous, and it's been restored recently. All right? And in this movie, the dichotomy between the head, the hand, and the heart is set up wonderfully. The head and the hand represent science and engineering. And the heart represents the human spirit. And the point of the movie is the mediator between the head and the hands. In other words, the head creates wonderful ideas. The hand then turns these into machines, weapons of mass destruction, whatever. right? And the only thing that mediates between those and says, you shouldn't do this is the heart. If you've never seen the movie, drop everything the next chance you get. It's wonderful. So before I talk about Edison and his two dynamos, let me talk a little bit more about the zombie ideas. What are some of the zombie ideas? Well, one of the zombie ideas is the idea that we have to focus on STEM subjects because we have to prepare students for careers, ignoring the fact that, for example, Harold Varmus was prepared for his career as a Nobel Prize winning scientist by being an English literature major. We're also told that universities have to be run like a business. All right. I can't think of a dumber idea. The marketplace is supposed to drive education. If there's no obvious market for a particular set of skills or a subject, we shouldn't be teaching it. We shouldn't be doing anything about that. 
There's only room for one market in higher education, and that's the marketplace of ideas. Anything else doesn't belong. Edison understood better than most the importance of science and engineering being tempered by other things. He was taught that lesson in a very interesting way. When he first invented the light bulb, he then, to show it that it worked, proposed to light New York City. And that required building a dynamo larger than any that had ever existed in the world before. And it turned out you couldn't build a single one. That didn't work. You had to build two. So he built two dynamos, and he linked them together, and he turned them on. And he found, to his horror, that one was pulling the other like a motor. And the whole thing was threatening to go careening out of balance. It was a problem in balance. He had to invent on the spot, in one day, the system of governors and regulators that we now use to link dynamos together when we have massively parallel inst installations like this. And it worked. He was able to bring these two dynamos into balance. And 30 years later, towards the end of his life, he talked about that. And he said he worried that the dynamo of our intellectual curiosity and scientific creativity might be running away with the dynamo of our humanity. And he begged people to put those dynamos into balance so that one doesn't pull the other, but that they work smoothly together in harmony. I've always liked that metaphor. And I think it's important that we keep it in mind. So here are the zombie ideas. And these are our enemies. These are the ideas we must fight in order to restore the kind of balance that I'm talking about. One is that austerity always leads to growth. Another is that market forces should control everything. Universities should be run like businesses. They should train people to meet the demands of industry which is interesting since industry never funds universities, <laughs> that only subject to practical value have any value, and that the future belongs to those best trained in STEM subjects. Every one of these ideas is wrong. Every one of these ideas holds sway in one or more places around the country and around the world. My first law refutes one of the more important of these ideas. You cannot cut your way to excellence. That never works. It's never worked in history. It doesn't work in companies. It certainly doesn't work in universities. You have to spend money in order to get money. Oddly enough, education and creativity are two of the few things where throwing more money at a problem actually helps. My second law, a university is not a business. And if you treat a university like a business, you are a damn fool. My third law, and this may be the most important one of all, there's no such thing as useless information. And by the way, I'm not the first person to enunciate this law. The first person to enunciate this law was our old friend Abram Flexner who said it when he created the Institute for Advanced Study. He was asked what subjects were going to be studied at the Institute for Advanced Study. He said every subject. And they said, how can you do that? He said, because there's no such thing as useless information. And he's absolutely right. There is no such thing as useless information. Everything has value. You don't always recognize that value. You can't always put your finger on it, but it's always there. So some of you may have read this essay of mine. I wrote this a number of years ago when a guy named Phillips at the University of Albany, State University of New York at Albany, shut down a number of humanities and arts departments at that university. And I wrote an open letter in which I said he was making a Faustian bargain. 
in order to try to gain economics for the university, in order to try to increase funding and maybe make things appear more relevant, he was sacrificing the soul of the institution. He, like Faust, was selling his soul to the devil for the sake of commercial success. This article got a lot of attention, not from President Philip, never heard from him, <laughs> but from a lot of other people. It's been translated in about 20 different languages, and it's been downloaded about a million times. Um, this was quite a few years ago, okay? 2010. Uh, eight years later, problem still exists. You still see this happening all over the place. The battle is not over. Okay. Earlier this year, Governor of Kentucky, Matt Bevan, declared that state colleges and universities should educate more electrical engineers and fewer French literature majors. Not clear to me why he picked on the French. <laughs> President Macron may have had something to do with that. Perhaps he flunked French. Who knows? Okay. Interestingly enough, Of course, if he'd taken any French literature himself, he would have read books like Marcel Proust's A la Recherche du Grand Perdu, the seven-volume Remembrance of Things Past, which is the longest novel written and one of the most interesting. And he would have learned from that novel the dangers of setting up an elite technocratic class, which Proust talks about, and why that's a bad idea unless you also have philosophy and other things to guide. So, Governor Patrick McCroy of North Carolina suggested basing funding on postgraduate employment rather than enrollment. Okay. Isn't that wonderful? Just what a great idea. So presumably, he didn't say employed in what? So maybe if we produce a lot, a lot of taxi drivers, we should consider ourselves fortunate educationally. But this is, and this is this year, okay? We're not done. 2010 is still with us. Marco Rubio called for more welders and fewer philosophers. It's not clear to me why welders. Plumbers I could see. Have you ever seen what a plumber makes? Woo. Right. I taught myself plumbing so that I could save money. And then Florida governor, for some reason Florida figures in this sort of thing a lot. Florida Governor Rick Scott proposed select, uh, sorry, steering students via tuition rebates to engineering, science, health care, and technology, and away from history, philosophy, anthropology, and English. In other words, all of these people, in their misguided attempt to make education something it isn't, all right, would create a system guaranteed to produce more Tuskegee syphilis studies and far fewer Nobel laureates, and far fewer innovations. They just don't get it. And it's our job to help them get it or elect people who do. Maybe they should listen to Steve Jobs. This is one of the things he said, which I've always liked. It's in Apple's DNA that technology alone is not enough. It's technology married with liberal arts, married with the humanities, that yields us the result that makes our hearts sing. By the way, that's an Apple computer I use. <laughs> now you know why. Well, this says in a sentence what I've been trying to say for an entire talk, which you'll be glad to know is almost over. So Dante's Inferno. All right. Dante's Inferno is particularly relevant to the summing up that I'm about to do for you. Dante created nine circles of hell. All right. And you can see he listed where you'd end up depending on your major sin. I look at this and I get very upset, okay? Because I'm clearly going to be spread out over a significant portion of the Inferno. And people mostly know about this. Um, for example, it's fairly well known that the, the lowest circle of hell is where Dante put the traitors. But there's a worse place than hell. 
in Dante's Inferno. A worse place in hell is the vestibule of hell, where you're not even worthy of hell. All right? You're tormented by being nowhere for all eternity. Did you know that? Do you know who Dante put in the vestibule of hell? Those who, in a moment of crisis, refuse to make a definite decision. For Dante, the people who would not take action when you have to take action were the worst of all. And Dante wasn't the only one who thought that way. So one of my favorite things to do when I was a boy growing up in Washington was to go over to the National Archives and look at the Declaration of Independence, among other things. And there's a line in the Declaration of Independence that has always meant something to me. It goes like this, when a long train of usurpations envisaged to subject them to absolute tyranny, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such governments and make provisions for their own future safety. What does that mean, translated from the ancient language in which Jefferson liked to write? What it means is that when something's wrong, those who have the ability to take action have the responsibility to take action. And if you don't, there's a place waiting for you. I think we're at that moment. I think we are at a time in this country where there is a battle going on between those who would try to change the educational system in a way that it must never be changed. I'm not saying it shouldn't change. There are many things that should be changed. But they would change it in a way that turns it into something other than what it must be. And those of us who understand the importance of education in its broadest terms, and that the only way we can have the kind of creativity and innovation in the sciences and engineering that we want is by never forgetting the arts and the humanities and their importance for scientists and engineers as well as people who major in those subjects. That battle is being fought every day in every state in this country right now. It's being fought at local school districts at high schools, at community colleges, and we, all of us, must get involved or Dante's vestibule of hell awaits us, and that might be a vestibule of hell on earth. Shakespeare in uh, Julius Caesar, I used to teach a course in Shakespeare, by the way, it was fun, says, there is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. You probably have heard this. But you may not have heard that this isn't the end of the quotation. There's another paragraph immediately following. On such a full sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. And that's where we stand now, and that's why I'm glad you gave me the chance to talk to you today about this. Because the fight for education in its broadest terms is a fight that must be waged every day by all of us, and it's a fight we have to win, or everybody is poorer, the country is poorer, we're all poorer. Now more than ever, in an age where everything is supposed to be relevant, of practical value, career-oriented, the scientists must stand up for the arts and the humanities because when we do, it carries more weights than when the arts and the humanities stand up for themselves. Michelangelo needs Galileo now more than ever. I hope you will agree, and if you agree, I hope that you will speak out and that you will make this institution a shining light in the educational firmament in such matters because we need examples like that. We have to show that it works. We have to show why it works. I've tried in this lecture
to talk about why the humanities and the arts are so necessary for the sciences. It isn't just to provide a moral compass for the work that we do. It's also to set our minds free. Because those are the subjects that do that. Those are the subjects that give us the creativity we're looking for. The arts and the humanities unchain our imagination. And when we then combine that with the tools of science and technology and a curiosity that is unfettered by the need to be relevant, unfettered by the need for short-term results, unfettered by the fear of failure. All right. When we combine all of those things, that's where innovation comes from. That's the wellspring of creativity. That's what we want. Thank you very much. I don't know if I'm supposed to take questions. Am I supposed to take questions? I'm happy to take a couple questions. Well, I didn't say I was happy. <laughs> I'm happy. OK. Uh, is there a mic? Okay, yeah. Don't know if it's on. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I think you bring up a lot of important points. Um, I, for one, was uh, had an undergrad education in the liberal arts, which I am very thankful for, uh, being at a big R1 research institution now. Um, but I do want to point out um, that in the Tuskegee syphilis study, they were not infected with syphilis by the people doing the study. The major issue, um, which I think is uh, more subtle and actually supports your argument even more, is that they were not informed that they could infect their wives and that uh, when the penicillin cure came out, they were not given the cure, which w now we know is the major crime. And I just You're right. Now I out. remember that's the case. Thank you for the correction. Thanks very much. I'm curious to know whether you consider tenure to be one of those zombie ideas. Some people would argue that uh, that allows people to have the freedom to uh, think creati uh, creatively, but others might argue that, in fact, tenure uh, preselects people that want a job for life and don't actually take chances. How old are you? I'll be 66 this year. So I'm 69. So you and I are both old enough to remember Joe McCarthy. That's why tenure is important. So tenure is important because every once in a while, political waves sweep through countries, which can be threatening individuals with contrary ideas. And universities must remain a bastion of contrary ideas of all types. And only tenure protects people with contrary ideas when those waves overwash a country. So the case of Joe McCarthy is pertinent. Harvard University was under tremendous pressure to fire many of its left-wing professors, and Nathan Pusey was able to use tenure as the reason for keeping them. So I realize that you can, the tenure can create an environment in which some people become non-productive and basically just take up jobs that other people should have. I'm willing to live with that for my own safety's sake. Uh, thank you. That was a great talk. I really enjoyed it. I'm curious what role you see nature playing in this, because many of the old philosophers there that you were talking about were also incredible natural historians. They knew so much about the natural world. And I think today, we, many of our problems are not ones solved by technology so much as solved by understanding how the natural world works and, and that that's a really important um, direction. I'm wondering, and also many of the classes that I missed out taking or that I love the most are those understanding how to identify trees or plants or kind of that basic thing. And those are being lost from many universities these days. So what role do you think nature plays in this, uh, this formula you have up here? I think it plays an enormous role, and not just for the reasons you said, which are absolutely right, but also because, in fact, a lot of really good scientific ideas come from looking at what nature does and trying to copy it. Particularly some good engineering ideas have come from that. Um, I would say, though, that we need to worry a lot about how much longer that natural world is going to be around. 
not just here, but elsewhere. So I made a pilgrimage to Africa two years ago because I was afraid there wouldn't be an Africa to make a pilgrimage to if I didn't do it quickly. I think this is a serious concern. And it, it means that if we believe, as you and I do, that this is important for creativity as well as just for the beauty of the things around us, then we also all need to be conservationists and we all need to work on that. Yeah. Thank you for an inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, and I agree with everything that you say. My question to you is very simple. What to do? So one of the things I learned in the 60s when I was an anti-war activist is that big solutions often don't work. That frequently if you try to do that, you often make a bloody mess of things. I think the answer is I don't make a specific prescription for any institution or place because institutions and places are different and different things happen for different reasons. I would say the solutions have to be local. That what you need to do is to involve yourself heavily in your own institution and in the institutions in your community. I'd pay particular attention to your schools. Uh, there are forces that have taken over school boards in many parts of the United States that have very wrong ideas about education. And that's partly because people like ourselves have not gotten involved in local school boards. So stuff like that, that you can do at the immediate level of this university, this town, this community, I think that's what I would argue. And rather than telling you exactly what that should be, because as I said, it differs from place to place, I would say, learn what the issues are, learn what the best solutions might be for your particular problem in your particular institution, and take an active role in promoting those. I used to, I used to be, you know, for big countrywide action. I found that usually just makes a bloody mess of things. <laughs>